Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, what are the mental health consequences of coronavirus? And I've also heard a few other questions about the epidemiology of coronavirus. So to answer these questions, I'll first start with the question, what is a coronavirus? So coronaviruses are really part of a large family of viruses, which may cause illnesses in animals and human beings. We know that several coronaviruses can cause respiratory infections in humans that can really range from the common cold all the way to something like SARS or MERS. Now, COVID-19 is the infectious disease caused by the most recently discovered coronavirus, also known as novel coronavirus. This new virus and disease were unknown before the outbreak that we saw in China in December of 2019. So now looking at the epidemiology. So epidemiology is the study of the cause, transmission, and control of illness. The term is used in both medical and mental health context. So in looking at something like COVID-19, we could look at the epidemiology of that disease, but also look at some of the mental health outcomes that are a result of the outbreak, and then kind of look at what causes both of these occurrences and what can be done to control it. Now, an important note here when we talk about medical compared to mental health, I'm not a physician. I have a PhD in counselor education and supervision, so I understand fairly well the epidemiological components of mental health. I don't really understand the mechanisms of viruses nearly as well. So how does COVID-19 compare to other viruses? Well, the normal flu in the United States, for example, affects between 10 and 40 million people and causes between 12 and 61,000 deaths. Since the beginning of the flu season that started in October of 2019, there have already been 18,000 deaths. Now, the death rate, that is the percentage of people who are infected that end up dying, is 0.1% for the normal flu. So I'll discuss the death rate of COVID-19 a little bit later on in this video. Now, we know that COVID-19 is more contagious than the normal flu. So a person infected with the flu, on average, would infect 1.3 other people. If somebody has COVID-19, they would infect 2.2 other people on average. So for more of a comparison, let's look at some of the other similar viruses. So the 1918 Spanish flu, which was the worst pandemic of the 20th century, caused 50 million deaths. The death rate was estimated to be between 1 and 3 percent. When we take a look at SARS, this is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, we see this originated in 2002 and spread to 29 countries. By the time it was contained in 2003, over 8,000 people had been infected and over 700 died. So we see here a 9.6 percent death rate. With MERS, this is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, we see this began in 2012, and it caused about 2,500 infections across 27 countries. About 850 people died in that outbreak. So the death rate there was 34.4%. The new or novel coronavirus is different from SARS and MERS in two ways that we know of so far. First, it spreads more easily throughout the public. We see that it reached more than 60 countries in less than three months. The second, it has a lower death rate. The death rate is estimated at 2.3%, looking at some of the data from China, although there's some other death rates I'll talk about that are much lower. The actual fatality rate for the novel coronavirus may actually be substantially lower than 2.3%, because there are people who are infected by the illness who only experience a mild case. Sometimes they experience no symptoms at all. Now, these individuals are typically undercounted when death rates are calculated. So the actual death rate could be as low as 0.2%. Now, just the overall death rate really doesn't tell the story because we see that the risk of death varies greatly based on age. Looking at the data from China, we see that if somebody's under 40, there is a 0.2% death rate. If they're between 40 and 50, it's 0.4%. Between 50 and 60, 1.3%. 60 and 70, 3.5%. 70 to 80, 8 percent. And if they're older than 80, it goes up to 15 percent. One interesting thing I noticed from looking at these data from China 
about the death rate is that for each decade somebody advances, if we're talking about somebody older than 40, the death rate approximately doubles. So we see that older individuals are at a substantially greater risk. Now, how bad will this get? So when we look at coronavirus, how far will this spread and how many people will die when it's all done? This is certainly a morbid topic and a few people have tried to address this, a few different scientists. We see some disagreement, but in general, here's the current status of the thinking, as far as I can tell from a variety of sources. I'll put the links to all those sources in the description for this video. We see that if the coronavirus becomes a pandemic, which is considered to be somewhat likely, about 40 to 70 percent of individuals will have the infection. Half of these people will not be symptomatic at all. Out of the remaining half, about one percent will die. Now, of course, this differs from other findings I've talked about. I'm talking about a different source here. But either way, we see one percent of half the people infected will perish from coronavirus. So this makes the impact of coronavirus 10 times larger than that of SARS. But still, this is not an existential threat. It's worse than the flu that we saw in 2009, to be sure, but it's not going to wipe out everybody on the globe or anything even close to that. It's actually only slightly more dangerous than the flu for people who are younger people who are younger than 65 specifically. So if we extend this math out to a ratio, what do we end up with? Well, at the low end, we see that one out of every 250 people will die. And at the high end, one out of every 142 people. So again, morbid statistics to be sure. Now, after viral infections, people generally develop antibodies that will fight off the virus and protect them from contracting the illness again. People who have had this new coronavirus may become immune to it, but we don't know a lot about this virus yet. It's not known how long that immunity will persist. With other coronaviruses, like the ones that cause the common cold, immunity doesn't always last. It comes back the next flu season. So considering all this, it's understandable that people would have some fear about novel coronavirus. But we've seen worse situations. Again, this is not even close to an existential threat. Now, from here, the question becomes, can COVID-19 lead to mental health symptoms? And the answer is yes, absolutely it can. There's so much we don't know about COVID-19, and I think this is what really contributes to anxiety and panic surrounding this illness. In a sense, even though mental health symptoms aren't contagious through the same mechanism as a medical illness, they are still contagious. We've heard of panic contagion, for example, and anxiety contagion. So we could think about this example. If you have a group of, say, a dozen people who are working to defuse a bomb, and one or two of those people run off in a panic, right? So they're working on like all those wires, trying to figure out which wire to cut or whatever, like we see in the movies. And one or two, again, just scream and run away. The remaining individuals typically will be affected. Some of them might have increased anxiety, and some of them might also panic. So in that sense, panic and anxiety are contagious. Again, like in that example, we see that a few people having those symptoms can result in a larger number of people having those symptoms. COVID-19 is contagious through a mechanical transmission. So actually having the virus introduced into somebody's body. That virus, this physical entity, has to get from one person to another. Anxiety and panic can transmit in different ways. They can transmit through the media, through conversations, websites, smartphones, television. It happens when people assign value to information. So essentially it's based on perception. If somebody lives in a rural community where no one travels in or out and they never hear of COVID-19, they're never going to panic and they're never going to have anxiety regardless of what happens in the outside world. Right? It has to affect them directly or they need to hear about it in order to have these types of symptoms. Now, some may look at anxiety and panic symptoms and say, yes, they are painful and unpleasant, but COVID-19 can be deadly. Why should we worry about the mental health side? Well, the answer is because the mental health side could cause pain and suffering as well. One of the concerns with the reaction to COVID-19 is that there will be an economic recession. This could actually lead to many deaths. 
we have seen this panic contagion operate during other outbreaks. Another concern is that panic could actually increase the number of people who die from COVID-19 because panic is not useful to prevention efforts. It often runs counter to them. If somebody's panicking, they're probably not going to act in a way that's going to optimize their chances of being prepared. It's not going to increase their chances of survival. We started to see panic buying already, cleaning out shelves of stores, even though there's no indication that there's a shortage of any supplies in terms of like food, water, anything like that. This particular behavior is thought to be driven by a loss of control. COVID-19 introduces risks that cannot be managed 100%, and people try to regain what they believed was a perfect sense of control, right? So people never had control in the first place, but COVID-19 makes them believe they have even less control. So this is where we see a lot of this panic behavior. I saw this one story where armed robbers stole hundreds of rolls of toilet paper from a supermarket in Hong Kong. So this was a violent crime. They had weapons, knives specifically. Now they may have not been stealing these for personal use, right? They may have been trying to resell them, but either way, a dangerous crime. And we see stories of people stealing toilet paper from public bathrooms in Japan. It's interesting to me how toilet paper would be the first thing that people would think of when faced with an outbreak. Not drinking water, canned food, or medicine, but rather toilet paper. I thought that was unusual. So there's a difference between taking reasonable precautions and going overboard. But that difference becomes obscured when somebody's in a state of panic. Another aspect of panic is it can make somebody feel left out, right? So if somebody's a bit worried about the outbreak and they have like a neighbor who's panicked and they're going out and buying all these products and filling their house with them, the person might think maybe that person knows something I don't know. Maybe the person who's panicking knows something that I haven't figured out. Maybe I need to panic too, right? But panicking is never the answer. Another interesting connection from COVID-19, or really from any outbreak, over to human behavior, is the interpretation of risk when hearing about the precautions that one should take to prevent the transmission of the illness. Some people will wash their hands regularly, avoid touching their eyes, nose, or mouth, and avoid people who have symptoms. All smart things to do. Those are preventive strategies against COVID-19. The problem is that other people will not. Right, So in a way, we could think about this as treatment compliance. When it comes to behavioral change, a predictable percent of the population will not change their behavior in response to an elevated risk. Consider an illness like type 2 diabetes. 40 to 90% of individuals with that illness do not take their medications as prescribed. Or consider something from the mental health arena, like major depressive disorder. 15 to 50% of individuals with this disorder demonstrate poor adherence to counseling treatment. We see a lack of consistency in terms of arriving at scheduled appointments, dropping out of therapy before goals are completed, and not completing homework, right? So people are suffering from the symptoms, but not complying with treatment, not doing everything they can to feel better. Now, the trouble with COVID-19 is that failing to take measures to prevent transmission doesn't just hurt the person who is infected, it hurts other people again, because the illness is highly contagious. Now, another mental health element of this outbreak is the rise of paranoia. We've already started to see this happen. It's not unusual during these outbreaks that conspiracy theories run wild. We see a lot of skepticism about how China has handled the reporting of information related to COVID-19, and this skepticism can easily turn into conspiratorial level thinking. The last part I'll talk about here in terms of mental health and behavioral impact of COVID-19 relates to isolating behavior. As a natural function of how disease operates, people will tend to isolate. They will keep their distance from one another. Physical contact will be reduced, so we don't see really people shaking hands or hugging. I actually think that the handshake is probably destined for extinction because of this last coronavirus. If COVID-19 is now something we have to deal with, all the time or every flu season, like if this recurs and we don't get a vaccine for a while, this will be the new normal. Necessary to protect life, yes, but saddening in a world where people are becoming increasingly isolated. So there are some thoughts on coronavirus and mental health. It's important to keep in mind that we're learning new information about coronavirus every day. So a lot of the different data that we see here in this analysis 
could change, really, again, very rapidly. The type of threat that coronavirus introduces puts a lot of stress on people, and this will certainly increase demand for medical services, really no question about that, but it'll also increase the demand for mental health services. It also puts providers at some level of risk, right? Again, being in proximity to people who could be infected. So there's just a lot of different angles to consider in terms of what types of stress this type of outbreak can lead to. Now, I know whenever I talk about sensitive issues like coronavirus, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions or thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.